Live from our newsroom, it's the Hard Times Podcast! With Bill Conway and Matt Sanko. All right, poor Cell, welcome to the Hard Times Podcast. How's it going? I'm happy to be here, man. It's great. It's good love, to see I you. I love Hard Times. Thanks. Uh, well, we love all of your bands. Uh, you've been in quite a few that have had a gigantic impact on my life. We're both straight edge kids, by the way. So mm-hmm. uh, no fucking mother- booze on this podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my mother uh, actually sent me a, uh, a f- she lives in Vermont and she was at a thrift store and she texted me. She's like, you're into that straight edge thing, right? And then she sent me a photo of a shirt that was on the rack and it was a Project X shirt. I was like, yes, send me that shirt right now. Um, Wow. And when it got to me, my mother was a smoker, so I could not get the smoke smell out of the shirt for like a couple (laughs) wash cycles. But now it is a regular morning long sleeve uh, Project X uh, shirt um, that that I wear often. But I just, I enjoyed the fact that it came smelling like such heinous smoke. How ironic. I'm a, I'm as bad as the shit you breathe into your lungs. Mm-hmm. You can tell your mom that line. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell her, her that. <laughs> I I anytime we're on the phone, I make her listen to that song before we can have a conversation. And she's like, "Why do you do this to me?" Uh, but it is what it is. She's more it's of a dance opener. floor justice fan. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, man. Uh, Project X. Love that shit. I, my b- band used to cover it when I was like 14, playing in garages. What is it about that song, Straight Edge Revenge? Like when you're a straight edge kid, there's just years of being made fun of and like shit that you take and, you know, people throwing stuff at you and dumping beers over your head. It makes that song just such a release. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? dude. It's fucking, it's hard. It's a, uh, you know, it's like, it's a release like where you don't need to shoot up the school, you know, you can just sing that exactly. song and then that's exactly. it. <laughs> I really hope people just listen to that song and just kind of like, yell along with it and not really take it too seriously and beat the shit out of other people. <laughs> That's what <laughs> my friends I and I did. Little, That's where you should I feel peak. a little guilty about it. You peak <laughs> with the project X cover and then you relex, you know, you know, just take it <laughs> yeah. easy. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I, I think one thing about that song in particular is the vocal style of it seems almost like panicked, you know, where it's just like there is a like, I, I don't know how to quite describe it, but it is not uh, it doesn't have that one register throughout it. There's a lot of uh, emotion in it. And it's just like, oh, yeah, OK, fuck it. Let's go. You know, and it's uh, I, well, I, I love it. Maybe it was a panic of our recording budget was twenty five dollars. <laughs> and we had to finish it in like 10 minutes kind of panic sound to it. <laughs> where was one that take, one recorded? Let's go. Um, we recorded at Don Fury's where like the Gorilla Biscuits record was recorded, Judge Single. Um, so many records were done there. Gnostic Front, Victim in Pain, um, Quicksand, a whole bunch of like all that early New York hardcore stuff was done at the same studio. I love the sound of a lot of those records, but particularly the Project X one. I love that it's like, there's like a certain, the vocals are, they're overblown, you know? So they're like, uh, it's like being like whatever it's called capped or whatever. Like it's like maxing out, but it sounds cool. It's like a natural distortion to it. So. Yeah. Yeah. That was probably my fault. I was probably <laughs> holding the mic. like. <laughs> um, do you ever get like uh, guys come to you like, on Facebook or whatever, like weird European dudes who like are still just like that song is like, they've got it like tattooed on their chest or whatever. And they're, they're just like, poor cell. I wanted to let you know, I killed someone today because of you. <laughs> no, but you know, it's so weird. Cause we did that project X record. You know, I'm sure you guys know the history of it. It was just meant to be like a record that was given away in our fanzine. It was almost like just a promotion thing for our fanzine. It was like a fun thing that we were did. We got together. We didn't tell anybody what our names were. It was sort of like a mystery. And for me to think that that record would have legs and still be walking around like decades later, it's just so beyond me. And a few years ago, we played a huge show. Judge played a show with Gorilla Biscuits in South America. Um, I forget where it was. I think it was, um, I think it was Argentina. I think it was Buenos Aires. And uh, Judge was headlining one night. It was like a one of these hardcore festival weekends. And Judge, like sort of like a, you know, a, you know, one of these black and blue kind of things, but in South America. So it was judge was headlining one night on a Friday night. And then gorilla biscuits was headlining on Saturday night. 
So it just so happened that all the members of Project X were there. And we were like, you know, wouldn't it be just funny if we just kind of like came out before Gorilla Biscuits and we just did a whole entire Project X set and we played all five songs. And so we just kind of like laughed about it. And we rehearsed it for like five minutes backstage and we're like, okay, let's do it. So Siv came out and before Gorilla Biscuits, like everybody's all excited for Gorilla Biscuits and hear the horns and everything. And Gorilla Biscuits is like, we're about to play, but before we play, Project X is going to play. And it was just supposed to be this kind of like funny, kind of quirky thing. But when he said that, we didn't even realize it, but there was probably maybe 800 straight edge kids at this show. Like it was just a sea of like X's on their hands and girls and guys. And like he said it and it was just like, <sighs> you know, there, was a, there were a lot of people at the show. There's probably like, you know, there's a, like a, maybe two or 3000 people at the mm -hmm. show in this big, huge hall. And so you just heard like, it was like, and Project X is going to play. And we just thought it'd be funny. No one would know the song and we'd get up there. And, but it was just like, Whoa. and then you just see like this army of X's kind of like make their way to the front <laughs> of the stage. And like, it's just rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of people like this with X's on their hands. And I was just like, <laughs> I came out, I was like, this is going to be effing awesome. And I said like a little thing and like, it was kind of funny because, and I said, this song's called fucking Savage Revenge. And then I like <laughs> ripped my shirt off. And then the place just like exploded. It like, ex there's videos out. You can look at the video on YouTube. You can I find think it. I it's saw the video like not long after this happened. One of my friends was like, Project X played. You, you can tell us the show because they had like a huge, like, um, you know, like, like those big screen things they have like a U2 show and like, you know, people have nosebleed seats they can see on the Teletron, you know, screen. They had one of those that just had the Gorilla Biscuits logo projected on it. And so if you come across a video of like huge Gorilla Biscuits, Gorilla says Gorilla in this Project X plan, that was from that show. And it was so crazy. I'm looking out in the crowd and literally there's like a thousand straight edge kids. Oh, that's straight. I'm <laughs> losing. Their shit. Like I'm talking like it was it was more crazy than like any kind of hate breed show you can like imagine. Like there's a huge pit and kids are kickboxing each other in the jaw. And I like <laughs> after we played, I'm just like, that's so freaking weird. Like here's a band we put together pretty much overnight. We wrote the songs overnight. We went in the studio. We kind of like laughed about it. we didn't take it seriously at all. We put it out in this fanzine. And here it is, like decades later. There's just some freaking chord that gets struck in your head when you hear that song, because when you're straight edge, I'm sure it's the same as it was when I was in school. It's a drinking culture. Our culture is like based around like if you're the cool kid, you party and it's like a drug culture. And like now it's even worse. Like before it used to be like when I was young, it was like a keg party in the woods. And now it's like, yo, let's go to a party and just do a bunch of like Molly or whatever the hell these Xanax. freaking kids yeah. do. <laughs> Xanax. And they end up on the floor like dead. The yeah. next morning. <laughs> so it's like even worse, you know? And so like, you, you know, even like today you have to go so against that grain of just like the way our whole freaking world moves to become straight edge. You have to have a lot of integrity because, you know, everybody's moving against you. Yeah. And so that song kind of like epitomizes that feeling. The whole world is against me, but fuck it. I'm going to be fucking straight as and fuck you if you can't handle it. You know, <laughs> yeah. this is the way I want to live my life. So it's sort of a crude, nasty song, <laughs> but it sort of hits on that sweet spot of like where every person who decided that they were going to be the black sheep yeah. kind of feels at one point in their life. And it's just like amazed that it resonates. It, it resonates deep with straight kid. It kind of reminds me of, uh, Ready to Fight by Negative Approach is another one where it's like any punk kid. That song is like it's a perfect cover song because they just relate to it. You're like, all right, this yeah, is just yeah, perfect. totally, yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's just somehow, somehow or other, you know, we were like, you know, 19 years old and we just stumbled onto an anthem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kids are still, you know, it's so funny because we go on tour, like Judge will go on tour, and undoubtedly, at least five, six, seven times a tour, the opening band will come up to me. Hey, Purcell, can you play Straight Edge Revenge with us? You know, the band will play and can you come out and sing? Like not like it's become like an institution now. Like I just have to get up <laughs> on stage with the opening band and people love it. Like, I don't know. It's just one of those songs that people just kind of 
can It'll really like, like it, rally eventually, around. Eventually you'll have a business that's like, it's uh, it's like after a president gets out of office and they give all those expensive speeches to banks, you know, you'll go around to some straight edge organizations, a private showing of, <laughs> of you doing that song. Yeah, that that would be nice to actually make money off of hardcore. <laughs> it pretty much sent me to the poorhouse for my whole life, but it was worth it in other ways, I guess. I think I was joking around with you guys when Youth of Today played Gilman. I think I was talking to you and Ray about how Gorilla Biscuits had this awesome like mascot slash logo and you guys didn't have one and you're like they can make all these fucking teddy bears about it and all, all these merch things and we can't <laughs> i think that's what you guys said i handed you like a hard times book and you're like oh this is great you got the little logo we didn't we didn't do like the mascot we should have done a mascot well it's funny too because we actually had a pretty iconic logo that straight edge fist the logo yeah but like but the, it's not like you can make like a doll out of it. It's not like mm-hmm. you can make a. It's not like Super Seven's going to make like a Youth of Today fist toy. You know, it <laughs> just doesn't one. translate. <laughs> it gets it gets a weird sexual uh, thing when you like, release <laughs> yeah. that in a latex. Like, hold on. What yeah, is- exactly, exactly. Are you a frustrated straight edger? Um, <laughs> or, do you not agree that uh, <laughs> is sex not one of the rules? Buy this fisting toy. <laughs> yeah, it could go. It can go in really weird direction real quick with you that. can make it one of those foam fingers that'd be cool <laughs> i've seen foam fingers at many shows yeah with big x's on them it's like the it's like uh, the, there's always that one kid in the crowd at the straight edge show with the big foam hand with the x on it when i was like uh you know um my peak in going to shows or mid 2000s the hulk hands had just come out like as like toys like these fake almost like um uh, I don't know, not styrofoam, but like padded Hulk hands and people would X those up and then just go and pit with those things on. And I just remember like every show, there's one person with the Hulk hands that is going around punching people in the face. Uh, I'm like, all right. Yeah, yeah, I tell you, every judge tour, there's that one joker that dresses up like a judge <laughs> and he does a stage <laughs> dive with the gavel and the wig. And, there, yeah, definitely, funny. <laughs> there definitely is something about punk shows like there's always there's a lot of times where there's just someone in a costume i even we'll book shows sometimes back before you were allowed to or whatever and there would just be a kid like in a mustard costume you know it's not halloween there's no real reason you know, it's just yeah. like there's just one guy always in a at, always at always at this is hardcore one of those kind of bigger shows there's always some kid in some kind of costume okay poor so i want to ask if you remember something it's Oakland. Youth Today is playing at the Oakland Metro. That's that place with like that really high stage. Ray's got a hurt knee at this show. I think you guys had just played L.A. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember that. You guys are in the van. A little kid knocks on the van and says, "Hey, I got a punk scene. I want to interview Youth Today." And then he ends up interviewing you. You remember that? Vaguely, I remember Ray with the hurt knee. <laughs> that was me. That was me oh, as was a little kid. Yeah. Uh, oh, I went cool. to go interview you today and you were the gentleman who was kind enough to entertain me as I was like, tell me about straight edge. Just questions I'm sure you've answered 10,000 times before. <laughs> well, young whippersnapper, let me tell you about straight edge. <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm, I'm actually, uh, my older brother got like the, the schism fanzine book um, and I steal it sometimes and look through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just badass, man. I, you know, I had a little zine too. Uh, what made you want to start that thing? Well, um, you know, Al, I did it with Al, ba- Al Brown from Gorilla Biscuits, who had you know passed on a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, really good friend of mine. We used to live together at Schism HQ. That's what we called our house. And he had a fanzine that was called Love Seat. And so he moved to New York. And it was a really the, the thing about about Al Brown that was so cool that people don't even realize is that. He he's single handedly responsible for giving New York hardcore a look Mm. like he like he didn't come up with the Gorilla Biscuits Gorilla. But like, you know, all like flyers and shows like he would make the flyers and he like designed the Gorilla Biscuits, you know, seven inch. And he kind of came up with that whole sort of youth crewy thing of, you know, everybody, everybody, you know, the the you know, the, the, the main kind of design at the time was real kind of like fucked up and photocopied, you know, like people would just rip shit out and tape it. And like, you know, everything was, was, was just very kind of like chaotic looking and like tribal looking. 
And he was the first guy that made things look really nice. And like, you know, his layouts were just kind of like, they were half punk rock and like half like, you know, Vogue magazine. Like everything was, you know, very, you know, all the typesetting was neat and everything was kind of like, um, you know, so he's sort of like, you know, he's partly responsible for that whole kind of like youth crewy thing of where things aren't looking punk rock and things aren't all fucked up and markered and cut and paste, but things are actually kind of like nice looking. And it was almost like translated into the whole like youth crew dress of like, we didn't have like mohawks and didn't shower for like weeks on end and we're like filthy and dirty, <laughs> but we wore like clean clothes and we looked a little clean cut. We had like, you know, short haircuts and stuff like that. He had a lot, he had a lot to do with that whole kind of aesthetic because he was going to design school. Um, I think he went to, I think he went to Parsons or something, you know, go, going to school for graphic design. So he was way ahead of his time on all those like design elements. And so he had that fanzine love seat that just looked really cool, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so when he, he came to me and he, and, you know, and he actually did, he did an issue of schism without me mm. and that he just did on his own. But if you knew, if you knew Al Brown at the time, he was sort of a shy kid. He was from the Midwest. He moved to like New York city, you know, which was a freaking hard ass place at the time. Most of the kids coming to shows are like, you know, living on the streets in squats. Mm -hmm. And he was a little bit just kind of shy to go up and like interview like rabies, like mm -hmm. Al Brown wasn't going to like walk. I mean, later on, as we all kind of became friends, he probably could have, but like at that time when he had first moved to New York, he didn't really know a lot of people. Um, it was before he was in Gorilla Biscuits. He hadn't even started. Uh, I think he, he was in side by side. He had started side by side, but he was a little bit, you know, just not a freaking big mouth like me who would go up and just like talk to anybody. <laughs> so he said, Hey, do you want to collaborate on a zine? You can do all the interviews and I'll do the layout. And I was like, yeah, sure. So that's kind of like how we work things out. I would be the man on the street interviewing rabies, interviewing all these, you know, agnostic front, all these other people. <clears throat> and um, I would do the record reviews because he was too scared that if he gave a bad review, he would get beat up. So I had to do it. <laughs> and, did that um, ever come to fruition? Was there ever a time where you did get like a letter to the uh, Schism HQ that said, hey, we're, next time I see you, you're fucking dead? No, but I have... Uh, I've done that to other people. There's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a famous story of... Um, you know, the guy from what's his name from Sonic Youth? What's the guitar player for Sonic Youth's name? Oh, uh, Thurston Moore. Thurston yes. Moore. So, Thurston Moore was a hardcore kid at CBG. He's like in the early days when like Youth of Today first got there, and he had a fanzine, he had a hardcore fanzine, and he gave Break Down the Walls like the worst review. <laughs> and he said, and he said some really, um, nasty shit about ray like just kind of like personal attacks on ray and so one time i was in some records and Dwayne from some records who was like a huge use today fan he kind of like i'm at the counter and he kind of leans over and he's like hey purcell there's that guy see that guy right there don't look over your shoulder but that guy behind you that's the guy that does that fan scene that gave break down the walls a bad review and said all oh, that shit about Ray. <laughs> <laughs> and I look over and there's Thurston Moore, this like skinny guy. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to freaking pound this guy. <laughs> I didn't know who he was. This was way before Sonic Youth. <laughs> and so he finally, he walks out of some records and he's walking down sixth street and I walk up behind him. And I grab him and I spin him around and I'm like, so, you're the guy that does that scene. You, how dare you say that shit about Ray Capo? Fuck you. You want to say shit about somebody? You say shit about somebody's face. You got something to fucking say to me right now, motherfucker. And I like got in his face and I scared the shit out of him. <laughs> you like the look of terror on this guy's face. He was just like, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I'll never do it. Blah, blah, blah. blah. And he just like took off. <laughs> never to be seen in the hardcore scene ever again. <laughs> I like to consider myself personally responsible for sonic youth because he kind of fucked off to like another kind of like art rock scene 
and he became famous with, at it with less <laughs> aggro straight edgers <laughs> he's like yeah, yeah man i can't, I can't hang like, around here man these guys are gonna he's uh, just like i'm out i'm yeah. out screw <laughs> hardcore i'm gonna just play this kind of like moodier nicer music with this nicer scene of art people you know what and I, like you know he became big i'd heard so, it's funny too you're like how dare you write that shit i'm sure you were writing stuff in your zine too you know um I, I think I remember a dude. No, but he wrote Mike. some. He wrote some dumb stuff like Ray Capo's a faggot. Ray Capo's this, like mm. you know, real just kind of like nasty stuff. <laughs> you know, for and for like he was the ultimate like you know before the keyboard warriors. Yeah, he was sort of the kid that was in the back that nobody really knew. No one knew who did this fanzine and thought he he could get away with saying you know with running his mouth. But New York was not like that back then, especially New York hardcore. <laughs> you forget it. <laughs> Speaking of um, covering some of your bands, uh, I tried to start a straight edge band at one point. I played in a couple, but I tried to start a straight edge band at one point with some friends of mine who I'd made that were living on the West Coast. One of them was a dude named Mike who was involved in the early New York hardcore scene. And I think he had a zine called like Bullshit Monthly. I think that yeah, was Yeah, Mike Bullshit. Mike Bullshit, yeah. Mike Bullshit, right? I became friends with Mike everybody. Bullshit. Yeah, everybody knew Mike Bullshit. He was the first openly gay person in New York hardcore. Yeah, like he came out of the closet and was just, man. Let me tell you, that took a lot of freaking guts. I mean, yeah. you, I, I don't know how old you guys were, but you know, in the eighties, eighties is like the most homophobic time like ever. And like, you know, even me, I wasn't homophobic, but I used the word faggot like every other word. It was just like mm -hmm. it was just one of those words like you're a dick, you're you're a faggot. It's just kind of mm -hmm. like you know, became one of those words that, you know, before even people realized that that's like really screwed up, you know, you're well, alienating, alienating, like, you know, a whole, you know, group of people. To your but, credit you know, though, to your credit though, I read some of your old zines and you actually had a history of asking people about your, you would say, Hey man, what's going on with some of this violence against gay people in the scene? You had a lot of questions in your zine about that, which I thought was well, really interesting it, at the time. It was a thing. Skinheads yeah. would go gay bashing. And me being like Mr. Posse was like, this is really fucked up. <laughs> but in Save the it for I, Thurston Moore, guys. I mean, what's <laughs> going on here? <laughs> but I remember reading that. I didn't, I go, pun I I didn't go, punch him. I just scared him. I didn't punch him. <laughs> I remember reading that and being like, damn, that was, you know, because you're talking to all these hardcore legend types and you're just saying like, hey, man, what's going on with this? This isn't right. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I know. There's like these. There's some weird answers in there too they're like we've really toned it down man we don't do it as much you know we don't do it as much <laughs> <laughs> um i remember you know ray ray bees to his credit really kind of turned turned around his life but you know the very first hardcore sunday hardcore matinee that i went to cbgb's i went to cbgb's like a couple of times before at night and i saw some like punk shows but the very first like hardcore matinee that i ever went to was agnostic front before Victim in Pain came out, this was it, this was actually a show where they were trying to like get money to record Victim in Pain. Mm. So United Blood had just come out. It was Agnostic Front, Death Before Dishonor, which became Super Touch. It was it was um, Mark Super Touch and Mike Drum and Mike Judge was playing drums. Um, so it was like one of the it wasn't the first time I met Mike, but it was probably the second time that I met Mike Judge was at that show. Um, Don Fury's band, that guy that had that studio that everybody recorded, he had this kind of like glam rock band called Balls, and they opened up. But the second band on the bill was this band called Skinhead Youth. Mm -hmm. And it was Ray B sang, um, Alex from Cause for Alarm, and he played on that Agnostic Front record, Cause for Alarm, played guitar. I forget who played bass and who played drums. But uh, skinheads, presumably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all they're all a bunch of like early skinheads, and you know this was Ray B's in his like dust phase, where he was just like smoking dust like twenty four seven, and he would there's all these stories about him like tying a guy to a chair and beating him half to death with a baseball bat. This was like Ray B's not in his right mind, and they had this song that was like it was called Black. They had a song called Black Plague, which I'm assuming is like an anti, mm -hmm. you know, which is a racist song, so like straight up racist song. And then, then they had a song about fag bashing. Mm -hmm. And he even said something like, this song is about fag bashing. 
Harley, I know you know what I'm talking about, or something like that. Maybe it wasn't Harley. Some he mm -hmm. called out somebody in the scene, like, "Hey, I know, I know, I know you know what I'm talking about." And I'm just like, "This is effing outrageous!" Mm -hmm. Like, here's a band; they're like openly racist. They openly like are into gay bash. And I was just like, you know, it's just kind of like struck. You know, it struck the higher values in me. It was like, this is fucking completely fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even yeah. back then, it was way before. You know, <laughs> I think this is. This is before Youth of Day started. This was when I was in like Violent Children. But to Ray Beast's credit, when he got off of the drugs, he actually became like super positive person. He went straight edge. He wasn't racist at all. He was, you know, he was, um, you know, he was openly anti-racist. Uh, how do we even get on the subject of this? Yeah, no, that, that's a, it's an interesting topic though, because. <laughs> oh, oh, because, because that's really how the scene kind of was in those early, in those early days. It was like, there's a lot of screwed up stuff that was going on. Yeah. It was just interesting to flip through, flip through some of your zines and be like, Hmm, seems like there was some stuff going on, you know? And I think a lot of times when stories get told, people don't want to tell the nitty gritty a little bit of how things got to be, you know, and, and the, the problems that were there and the problems that got resolved are not all the way resolved. You know, and I grew up in the punk scene too, where, for example, my version of this is I grew up in a punk scene where it was 100% normal to see old dudes with very young girls at the shows. So, you know, guys who play in bands would be 40 and they'd have a 16 year old girlfriend, 15 year old girlfriend. And it was, commonplace and it wasn't hidden it was like they're at the show arms around each other and stuff and that it's was so fun. it's so it's so weird because when i hear that it strikes me so weird because when i was a kid you know like this the ceiling for the age of people being at a show was probably like 22 23 <laughs> like when i found out that like Vinny stigma was like 30 i was like what he's 30 what is he doing at a hardcore show it's so ironic because here i am like a freaking middle-aged man still playing hardcore shows jumping around on stage but um yeah it was just like that's not how it was it was it was it was literally a it was super impressive because it was a scene of teenagers and it was like teenagers doing everything. It was like, you know, teenagers booking shows, teenagers booking tours, teenagers in the bands, you know, it was, you know, teenagers making the merch, you know, me and Al Brown used to make our own merch in our bathroom with like freaking hair dryers and, um, you know, crazy stuff. It was really cool. Cause it was, it was super empowering when you grew up in a scene like that, you just think, I don't need anybody else. I'm just going to do everything myself. It, like that DIY ethic was so kind of stamped into our brains. And it was really cool to see how a bunch of like motivated, focused, determined kids, what they can do. We were a, a bunch of friggin' kids. And that was I, almost like the beauty of it. I always say that being a member of the punk scene and hardcore scene taught me that if you can get four of your most dysfunctional, broke, crazy teenage friends in a van and book a tour across the country and make it back home alive. You can kind of do anything. That's what it teaches you. You know, you're yeah, like, exactly. We don't need a label to put out our stuff and we don't need. And then it goes even further. It's like if you have a product idea, you don't need uh, to bring your product idea to a business. You can start your own business. I think DIY is one of the best things uh, that that came out of the punk scene personally. Yeah, it made me like it made me the, the fiercely independent person that I am today. You know, when I was 18 years old, I, I booked the first Youth of the Day tour, the Can't Close My Eyes tour. I didn't know how to book a tour. I wasn't a professional. I'd never done it before. But I just had this burning drive that I'm in this band. I really want to go out there and play. I really love this record. I really love the, the message. I'm just going to book it myself. No one else is going to do this for me. I have to do this for myself. So how did you do that at, at the time? Were you just getting on the phone with like, a contact list that you acquired or? Uh... Um, I, I, you know, I was friends, you know, just from youth today playing just the sparse amount of shows that we had played. Like I knew, you know, the, the booking agent in like Albany and one in Connecticut. And I knew, um, I knew Mike Gitter who booked shows in Boston and a lot of them gave me numbers like they were in contact with other people that book shows. And Kevin Seconds, Seven Seconds was, was going on tour at the same time. And I said, I said, Kevin, can you can you get us on some of the shows? And he's like, the tour is already booked, but I'll give you all the numbers of all the promoters. You can call them up and see if you can get on the shows. And so I had like we played like, you know, maybe around like half the shows were with Seven Seconds. I just called up the promoter. 
please, we're on Kevin Seconds record label. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. So like a lot of times they would be like, no, I'd be like, you don't even have to pay us. And they'd be like, okay. <laughs> and so we played a lot of those, we played a lot of those shows and you know, a lot of them, you know, it was just me calling up another 18 year old kid in Virginia beach. Hey, I heard you put on shows. Can you put on a youth today show? Yeah, sure. And, um, yeah, it was really super empowering to see what a bunch of kids can do. Which uh, was at the tour. Tell me about, I've heard about this, uh, I think it's like an Arizona pool hall that you guys played. Tell me about that tour. What, what it, do you know the, the that, story I'm referencing? Yeah, that was, yeah. The break, that was the break on the wall store. How, how did you hear that story? I think I was actually watching some Instagram live thing from St. Vitus. And you were, yeah. you were telling the story that I hadn't heard before. Uh, yeah. It was it was a really interesting. It was so it's youth of today break down the walls, um, Arizona, and you're playing in some pool hall, and then uh, a bunch of skinheads show up. Uh, I'm guessing not the type of skinheads I grew up around, which are all like um, anti racist skinheads. Um, no, these are sure. all these are a gang of straight up Nazi skinheads. Right, they were called <laughs> the Sun City Skins. I know I forget what city was, but the city's nickname Sun City, somewhere in in Arizona. I believe it's the Sun City Skins, and so they showed up because they knew we were straight edge. They were knew we were anti racist. You know, when you were in a straight edge band at that, this was way before there was like even a straight edge scene. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, after Break Down the Walls came out and that record became like a really popular record, then a kind of like scene like started around America and there was actually like a straight edge scene like that we know of today. But before that, there wasn't a straight edge scene. And so, um, you know, sometimes you would go into these places where there wasn't any straight edge and there's something about straight edge. That's very confronting. Yeah. Because if you're, if you're a kid and you're all fucked up on drugs and you know, you you're sniffing glue and you're doing all this like stuff that, you know, is not good for you. You know, it's negatively affecting your life. And then you have a band that gets up on stage with huge, big black X's on their hands. And we're singing, we don't want to do this because we don't want to fuck up our life. You know, it makes you sort of, it's sort of like putting a mirror in front of your face and like, what the hell am I doing with my life? So it's very confronting. And so people can either do two things. They can either get very reflective and be like, hey, maybe, maybe I should kind of like, you know, take some of these ideas to heart. Maybe I can improve my life a little bit. Maybe I'm not, I won't be sleeping in my own puke for the third time this week. Or people can just get really effing angry and they're on a lot of drugs and super drunk. Yeah. And so it's just like a recipe for, for fights. I, had a, I, ha I tell a story that people sometimes don't believe because I think because they're not straight edge. I was a straight edge kid. I was in high school. We had just played some show. Afterwards, we're going to a local Denny's, right? And so we're walking in and I have X's on my hands, um, big black, I love Project X style X's, right? And um, <laughs> a guy walked up to me and he said, uh, hey man, do you have a smoke? And I said, oh no, sorry, I don't smoke. I, I kept walking. I swear to God, that was the tone that I used. He looked at my X's, looked back at me and headbutted me. <laughs> this big fight breaks out. But, you know, I also had a time at a work party. I got one of my first jobs. I had a guy say, uh, it was at a bar. He said, hey, uh, um, have a drink. I said, no, sorry, I don't drink. He said, okay, let me ask you a question. Are you in recovery? And I said, no. And he said, I get that all the time. I get that all the time. He stood up out of his chair after I answered that question and went, you arrogant, self-centered motherfucker. You think you're better than everyone. He just started exploding on me. Just all this pent up. I don't know what I have triggered in him. This is at a work yeah, party. And what is it? What is it that's so <laughs> confronting about straight edge? I seriously, I wasn't, I'm not coming up to this guy slapping beers out of his hand. I said, no, sorry, I don't drink. <laughs> Uh, anyways, conti continue your story. So you're hanging I mean, out with the Sun all, City Skins. First, you're the leader, first, right? You're first, the <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, just in our defense, used to today, we're just about the most polite guys you could like. People would bring us over to their house, you know, because we never stayed in hotels. It was after the last song. Hey, anybody got a floor we can sleep on? And that's how we would tour because we didn't have any money. And um, because you had already us. you already told everybody you'd play for free, just put us on the show. And uh... yeah, exactly. You don't even get paid for the show. We have no money, no gas money. 
So we would get to people's houses and parents loved us because we didn't drink, we didn't smoke, we were positive influence on their kid. We were super polite. We were super gracious. Thank you, you know. Um, so it wasn't like we were a bunch of guys that were out looking for trouble. We were like the opposite. We were like posse kids, you know, that was our whole thing. So, you know, but just it's it you just get yourself in these places where people are just so fucking pissed off that you're trying to improve your life. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. It's weird that they will actually attack you. They'll physically so attack you, you. And it's like I'm yeah, I'm not even I'm not even concerned about your life, buddy. I just I literally just said no sorry, I don't drink, you know? Yeah, it's it's just kind of like a strange thing about human nature. So these guys came to the show purposely to kick our asses because they're like, fuck these straight edge anti-racist guys. We listen to screwdriver. <laughs> and so we're in this, we're in this and what a place to have. That's like their riot. Facebook statuses, uh, you know, not at the time, I guess they're writing letters to each other. That's just like their Evo. Yeah. I listen to screwdriver. Fuck these straight edge kids. Right. Yeah. You know, and lucky, lucky for us at this time, um, the lineup was me, Capo, um, Walter, and then we had Mike Judge playing drums, and we had Richie from Underdog, who nobody even realizes. He's a freaking incredible fighter. <laughs> he is such a nice guy. He's soft-spoken. He's crazy polite. You know, you would never believe it, but you push this guy over the edge, he will fucking kill you. And he's like, <laughs> you know, he grew up, you know, with martial arts and, you know, stuff like that. So he knows how to fight. And so he was our secret weapon. And Mike Judge is just like a hothead. He's still a hothead. <laughs> you know, you say the wrong thing to that guy, he's in your face. And he's got like, to this day, he's like that. So, you know, luckily we had those guys in the band because, you know, you know, they're, they're good backup to have in these yeah. situations where people want to kill you. And so these guys walk in, they're sig hiling, they're skinhead. We just know there's going to be trouble. And what's the worst place to have a fight? A pool hall. Because there is freaking <laughs> sticks everywhere and heavy ass balls. You ever get hit with a freaking pool ball someone throws at you? It freaking hurts, man. And so we're playing and somehow these guys just bum rush the stage. And in like an instant, it went from a hardcore show into a full scale old freaking Western saloon <laughs> brawl. And everybody is grabbing pool cues and hitting each other. Pool And there's just pool balls are throwing. People are getting hit in the head with pool balls. People throwing them as hard as they can. I'm just like, and it's easy to find these guys because they're all in that. They're all skinheads. They all have no shirts with suspenders. So I just got, the, I'm just have this like, you know, pool stick with like holding onto the skinny end with the heavy end out. And I'm just clocking any guy in suspenders that I can see. <laughs> and it's, it's literally a riot. It's a full on riot. There's some innocent the, old man who just prefers suspenders over a belt. <laughs> that came to I, the I, on I, the show. I hope so. Because <laughs> I probably took him out. I probably cleaned his clock. <laughs> and it's so funny. It was, it was just like, and then the whole thing spills out into the street. And then typical, it was almost like one of those 80s movies where it was like, you know, the outsiders or something where you spill out in the streets and you have the, this like face off with the rival gangs. It was sort of like that. It kind of spilled out into the street and then it sort of calmed down a little bit. And it was used to today on one side, all these skinheads on the other side. And we're just kind of like talking shit to each other. And I don't know how we, we negotiated this, but we sort of negotiated like, Okay, you guys outnumber us like three to one, four to one or whatever. Um, but if you guys want to fucking fight, you take your toughest guy and we'll take our toughest guy and let's fucking fight. It was like one of those like outsiders <laughs> moment, moment. And they said, okay. And so they had this huge skinhead guy. We had Richie. <laughs> and so they said, okay, let's do this. Meet us at McDonald's because <laughs> we thought the cops were going to come because it was just this riot. And, you know, obviously the guys, you know, the owner is probably calling the cops as we spoke. I love the so idea said, of, of you and Capo, like taking off your glove and slapping someone and being like, we challenge you to a duel. Right? We basically <laughs> challenged them to a duel. It's a Your champion versus champion. Versus our... I think that that used to happen like medieval wars, right? Wasn't there an idea that you take your biggest guy and that would settle the overall feud? I saw it's it in a, a movie with Brad Pitt. I think it was called Troy. Yeah, <laughs> dude, dude, it's a thing. It's a thing. Somehow or other, it was a thing. Even so then. you guys chose Richie. So we chose Richie. They didn't know we chose Richie. We just said our biggest guy against you, our our best guy against your best guy. They said, yeah, they had a really big skinhead guy, and so they said, <laughs> and they said meet us at McDonald's. And McDonald's was like probably like a ten minute drive. 
So we get used to the day van. And the whole time in the van, we are amping up Richie. Richie, fuck up that skinhead. Fuck racism. <laughs> fuck them. Fucking kill those, kill that motherfucking racist bastard. And Richie is just like, I am going to fucking kill this guy. I'm going to do it for freaking every black person in America. You know, I mean, we're like really <laughs> pumping him up and he is pumped up. We get to McDonald's. Richie kind of spills out of the span like a freaking pit bull. And he's just like, where is that? And all those dudes are there. And they just said, and they come, and Richie comes out of this thing like a fucking bat out of hell. Like, where is the guy? I will kill him. Let's go. Fuck you, skinhead, racist skinhead motherfuckers. <laughs> and guess what? The guy straight up pussies out. <laughs> straight up. Their biggest guy's like, I don't want to fight this crazy motherfucker from New York City. <laughs> we are out. And they basically uh, said, like, fights off. You guys win. We're out. And we were like, yeah! <laughs> yeah! You the defeat the racist skinheads! Chocolate off for straight edge! I wonder if they were, like, coming down off of some meth or something by the time they got to McDonald's. And they're like, you know what? There's plenty of other racist stuff we could be yeah, off doing right I now. Think, I think their <laughs> adrenaline wore off, whereas we were just, like, pumping Richie up. I think maybe you have a little bit more stamina when you're not drunk out of your mind. A little bit more cardio. You guys Straight are all doing yoga poses off. on the way over there, getting ready and stuff. Well, we weren't doing yoga poses, but we were definitely doing cardio. We were like into doing push-ups and running. And, you know, we were like the fitness band. Before okay. it was cool to be into fitness. <laughs> I had a question going back. This was something, and I'm curious about your opinion on this. I remember when I was first getting into punk and being a big Dead Kennedys fan and I listened to an old Jello Biafra spoken word album and he talked shit on Youth of Today uh, being yeah. like a generic band name. How did you guys feel about that? Like, I have to assume you heard it. Oh, there's a whole great story behind that. You know, guys don't know that story, me versus Jello Biafra? I don't, I don't think I've ever heard this. Buckle up. Buckle up. <laughs> you thought Thurston Moore was bad. Here it's, we go. It's Porcel in the van and all of his boys are like, you're going to fucking rip this guy apart. <laughs> We're going to drive straight to San Francisco right now. <laughs> okay, let's get all the fight stories out. Okay, so um, me, and Ray are, me and Ray are in Violent Children and Violent Children's a straight edge band. And um, so we go to this dead Kennedy show in Connecticut. And let me tell you, I'm a huge dead Kennedy's fan. Dead Kennedy's were like one of the first bands I got into. Like I love them. I revered them. I thought Jello Biafra was the coolest guy in the world. I had seen the dead Kennedy's many times before. I loved them, had nothing but good things to say about the dead Kennedy's. And so we were at this club and at the club, it's a thing. You just kind of like in between bands, you hang out and everybody just sits on the stage. And then the band comes out, they play, you know, people like get off the stage and, you know, are into the pits. So we're all just kind of like hanging out, sitting on the stage, waiting for the dead Kennedys to come on. And the dead Kennedys had this like manager who was like a middle aged looking like businessman, didn't look punk at all. And he had an English accent and he comes up to, he comes up to us and he's like, and he's a real dick. He's like, listen, you assholes. You better get off of this fucking stage or the dead Kennedys will not fucking come out until every last one of you has your asses off the stage. Like a character from Spinal Tap. Like, and yeah, I was kind of like, and we look at this guy and we're just like, you don't tell us, you don't tell something like, a, you know, six, I don't forget how old a 16, 17 year old punk rocker to do that. We're like, we'll turn around and I just turn around and look at the guy. I'm just like, fuck you who the fuck are you <laughs> fuck you and so he ran back and he like told jello and then we made a statement like we're not getting off this fucking stage fuck that guy fuck the dead kennedy's the fucking rock stars and so we're all just sitting on the stage and so the dead kennedy's come out and the song starts and i'm super excited to see the dead kennedy's i have no beef with the dead kennedy's i love them their manager's a dick but i'm excited <laughs> to see the dead kennedy jello comes out the first song starts i forget i'm like and i'm still sitting on the stage and the first song starts and i'm just so happy i'm about to like get up to stage dive and jello runs across the stage and he fucking kicks me so goddamn hard in the back i swear to god i had a bruise on my back the next day 
that was dark purple and it was like this big, like right, like on top of my kidney. He hit, he kicked me so motherfucking hard. Like with all of his might, like I was trying to kick a field goal. Like literally I like spilled off the stage. I'm like holding my side. I'm like, ah, it hurt. Like it, it probably like damaged my kidney a little bit. That's how, that's how hard he kicked me. And he kind of like knocked me in the crowd. And at first I'm holding my side and then I kind of collect myself and I'm like, I'm going to fucking kill that guy. I <laughs> am going to fucking kill Jello Biafra right here, right now. Fuck the dead Kennedys. Fuck Jello Biafra. Do you want to know what I did? I had a big X on my hand. Um, so I got on stage and I, and I went up to Jello and I went like this in his face with my X. And then Klaus Flora, the bass player, was playing was playing uh, bass with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I went over to Klaus Floride. I took the cigarette out of his mouth. I threw it on the floor. I stamped it. And then I went to the side of the stage, and they had all these glass pitchers of water because, you know, the, the band would just take the pitchers of water, and they would pour it in glasses. And I took this pitcher of water, and I was about to smash Jello Biafra over the head with this pitcher of water. I kid you not. I would have done it too. I was so livid at Jello Biafra and I grabbed it. And this one guy that I knew from, from the scene was working security. And he's like this really cool older guy. He was always like super cool to me. I had a lot of respect for him. And I grabbed this picture and he, and he grabbed my arm. He was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm about to smash Jello Biafra over the freaking head with this glass picture right now. And he was just like Purcell, you got to calm down, dude. Just calm down. Don't do it. There's going to be glass all over the floor. There's going to be like, you know, the crowd might turn on you. You might kill Jello Biafra. It's like, <laughs> this just isn't a good idea. Just like, don't do it. And he kind of like put his hand on my shoulder and he kind of like went like this very gently and very nicely. And I like kind of like went to my knees. He's just like, here, just watch the show right here. Everything's cool, man. Just like be cool. Um, That's but the friend. whole time. He was kind of like, he was, he was like the voice of reason, but I was sitting by the side of the stage and you want to know something? I just couldn't let it go. I just could not <laughs> let it go. Like I was so pissed because, you know, I come from the school where we're all punk rockers. It's us against the world. We're all one. There are no rock stars. The stage is, the stage is ours. The stage is yours. You know, that's like the kind of culture that punk was, was to me. And that was like the culture of punk person person like you know falls down the pit you pick them up person stage dives you try to catch them you know i come from that whole kind of thing and for him to kick me it was such a betrayal of that kind of of that kind of punk code that i was just so pissed and i was just like you know this guy's just a you know this guy's supposed to be mr punk rock he's just another one of these fucking rock stars you know what i mean and so i just kind of like waited for my time I just waited and I was just like, I'm just going to wait for the perfect moment. So like two songs went by and then finally, finally, Jello by effort does a stage dive. And this is so great. There's actually a picture of it. Jello by effort does a stage dive. And then I was like, this is my chance. <laughs> and I ran across the stage and I did like a flying elbow. And someone actually took a picture of me like, Jello by Afro crowd surfing and me in the air with my like elbow, like <laughs> macho that. man I style. I, I think I got it. So I, I have that picture somewhere or Tim McMahon or somebody probably, probably has it. <laughs> and so he's like, he's on top of the crowd, of course. And then I came in and I did this flying freaking elbow, like right on his back. And I was like, as this guy kicked me in the back, I'm going to elbow him with like everything I have in them. And I jumped off the stage and I was just like, ah, damn. <laughs> and I elbowed him right in the back. And of course, like he's yellow by effort. So everybody's holding him up, but I kind of fell through the crowd. And so he's right above me and I get up and his feet are right there. So I grab his foot and I'm like twisting his foot as hard <laughs> as I can. And he's on the crowd and he's going, <laughs> like I can hear him like scream, ah, my foot, ah, and I'm twisting his foot as hard as I can, like MMA, like joint lock style. And then, um, and then he, and then he gets back on stage, and then I was like kind of in the crowd, and I like kind of whatever, but it just kind of like ruined it for me 
it ruined the dead Kennedys for me. It ruined like everything for me. So afterwards, you know, he doesn't know. We're friends with everybody at the club. We're friends with all the security. All the security are punk rockers like us. We go to shows with them every week. So I went to my friend. I was like, hey, me, me and Ray both got together. We both have big X's on our hands and like SSD shirts or like whatever. And I said, hey, man, we just want to talk to Jello. And the guy's like, listen, be cool, man. Don't beat up Jello Baffer. I was like, no, we just want to talk to him. We just want to talk to him. And we went back. I was like, hey, dude, why did you kick me? Like, why did you not only did you kick me? And then Ray was like, show him your back. And I pulled up my back and dude, I had the nastiest. You can't, you couldn't believe this bruise that I had on my back. It looked like I, I had to go to the hospital or something. And Ray is just like, look what you did to his back. Like, is this what your punk rock is all about? Is this what your songs are all about? Is this what you like your dead Kennedy's high minded thing has culminated that for another punk rocker, you're just going to kick him in the back like that and really freaking hurt him. Like, what's your, and we were just like, what's your deal, dude? And he's just like, Vi oh, I know all about you, violent children. You guys are violent children. That's exactly what you are. I should rename your band Violent Babies. <laughs> and he's like, get, and he's getting all, he's, he's sort of like talking shit, but he's sort of like all the way on the other side of the room and like ready to <laughs> escape at like any second. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we kind of like went back and forth after a while. And then he said all this stuff like you and your straight edge elitism bullshit and blah, blah, blah. And like, and stuff. And, and you got I was like, spoken oh, words directly to your face, huh? Pretty much. And then I was just like, <laughs> I was like, dude, you can say what you want, but that rock star bullshit of get off the stage. And this is our stage and having your fucking manager try to kick everybody off the stage. I was like, that's just not how we do it here. And it was a really bullshit move. It was a bullshit move by your manager. It was a bullshit move to kick me in the back like that as hard as you could. I was like, what do you think? You can just go around kicking people and they're not going to try to come and kick your ass? I was like, because you're jello by Afro? I was like, dude, if someone fucking kicks me in the back, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to fight them back. Like, I don't know. I was like a football player in school. Like, that's just like my mentality. <laughs> and then like, it just kind of like went back and forth, but like, Jello found out that, you know, then we were in that band Youth Today and then he hated Youth Today. And then he like he wrote a bunch of stuff and he like did a spoken word stuff like anti Youth Today. But it actually culminates in a good thing. There's, there's a silver lining to the story. Mm. So Youth of Today used to always stay at um, at Maximum Rock and Roll House whenever we played Gilman Street. And we were really good friends with all those people from from Maximum Rock and Roll, including Tim Yohannan. Mm -hmm. And so Tim Yohannan kind of like, he had a, like a lot of respect for youth today because, you know, we sang about all these like higher values and things like that and actually had a kind of mission to the band. So he respected that uh, 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 about us. And um, so one day he said, um, Hey, Jello's coming over. He goes, he doesn't know you guys are, he doesn't know you guys are there. He doesn't know you guys are here. Maybe I should tell him you, that you guys are here. He's just like, I just want to make sure everything's cool. And this was like years later, like mm -hmm. years later. And we were like different people at this point. And then Ray said, yeah, you know, there's no way, like I have no bad feelings to Jello. As a matter of fact, I would just like to speak to Jello and just kind of like whatever, bury the hatchet if there's any bad feelings. So they heard mm -hmm. he said all this bad stuff about you today. So he got in the car with Tim Yohan and they went and they kind of like picked up Jello somewhere and they drove someplace. And so, Ray and Jello had this conversation in the car for like maybe 20 minutes or something. Mm. And they all were, it was all kind of like, yeah, you know, no hard feelings. We love you. We love you. Hug it out, you know, and they time kind of, heals all wounds. Right. I, yeah. Young. So we, so I, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I like the dead Kennedys again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love I the dead Kennedys. Hearing, I, I love hearing, them. They're incredible. Oh, yeah. Uh, I remember hearing that spoken word thing and just being like for every other thing that he was saying that I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. Like that one part of it. I was like, what does this have to do with anything? Why are you even bringing this up? Like what a weird aside. Uh, it seemed uh, strange and vindictive in, uh, in, in that, uh, that hour long speech that, he, that he's giving, but uh, my yeah, now, you know, now, you know, <laughs> my Jello Bay after story is I was a journalist and uh, I convinced my editor that I was at working at SF Weekly. I was going to write about uh, 
Jello or some event that he was having. And uh, I literally said, I called him, I got on the phone with him. We had a 45 minute long little slot to talk. And I said, Hey, Jello, how have you been? That's all I said. The next thing I said was, okay, well, unfortunately it's been 45 minutes, so I'm going to have to let you go. I, I had no control over the situation. It was, we were 35 minutes in and he was naming off city council people that he had personally betrayed him, all these different you know, proposition, this proposition, that I'm like, damn, I don't know. He's like, that dates back 30 years in San Francisco. I'm like, I don't, dude, you you should be the journalist at this point. I think he got, got me yeah, beat right. on this stuff. <laughs> yeah i mean nothing but respect for that guy he like he wrote some great lyrics and i mean i find it ironic that he ripped off his band you know and he and he got busted for it and he, and he was keeping all the dead kennedy's royalties for like years <laughs> here's a guy who's so against like you know corporate exploitation and you know money and you know unethical business practices and for years <laughs> He's not paying his band members royalties <laughs> and keeping all the money. How ironic is that? I know that we wrote a couple of articles about him at the, on the hard times and uh, the dead Kennedy's Facebook page would share it, but it's like, you know, it's no longer Jello's dead Kennedy's. It's just the other guys. in the band. Yeah. <laughs> I really wish those, you know, one reunion that I would love to see is the original dead Kennedy's. Wouldn't that be cool? It'd be fucking great. Mm -hmm. Sing yeah. all those songs again. It'd be amazing. Yeah. I saw, I saw, I think he had some other band, I don't know what what it was called. Jello Jello Biafra and the yeah the we Guantanamo played with them a bunch security guards or something. I don't, what was it? I yeah, don't know. yeah we played with them a bunch of times. They did a bunch. They did a few Dead Kennedy songs. I remember it was like it was not more than like five years ago, and Jello did a big stage dive. I was like, damn, dude, he's fucking still going for it. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, Porcel. Uh, we had uh, Sammy on, and we're talking to him about um, a particular time on tour. Um, where uh ray like had him stay there was a there was some sort of like uh i think it was during shelter and there's like some sort of teacher on tour with you guys and sammy got put in the back with this guy and was like got like an hour long lesson that he wasn't <laughs> exactly in the mood for and yeah i wanted to ask if you remember anything from those times uh and as the the various bands you guys were playing in as you got more and more into that stuff if there's any uh, funny culture clash between you and your friend group and you and your, your other band members. Well, that was the very first shelter tour ever. And this was way before I was in shelter, mm -hmm. but um, Ray just came up to me and Sammy and he said, Hey, look, man, I, I have no other band members to put this band together. Do you think you guys would just Sammy, can you play drums? Purcell, can you play guitar just on this tour? Mm -hmm. And we're like, yeah, we'll do it. You know, whatever. It'll be fun. And so it was Shelter, Quicksand played before Quicksand was really big. And then Inside Out, which was Zach Rage Against Machines' uh, previous band, all opened. And so it's crazy um, to think that uh, he, he's, he's opening that show. That's uh, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Um, so it, yeah, it was a, it was a great tour. And so the so Shelter traveled in a whole bus. Not, not only did they have a bus with a whole Bhakta program with all these like Hare Krishna students, um, but they had like a sannyasi monk. And then they had another sannyasi monk that was in, um, he was like a guru that was in like a separate kind of uh, bigger van. Mm. And so what they would do is, and then we had a van, but we didn't, there wasn't enough room to fit everybody in our van. So like two people would either have to go in the Krishna bus or they would go in this, in the other smaller thing with the guru. And so Ray would send people who we think would kind of like be open to, you know, spirituality to go with the guru. And of course, like you're with a guru, you're going to talk about kind of spiritual stuff. But what was really cool was, and then it was my turn to get stuck in the van too with the, with the guru. <laughs> but I got put in, it was me and Zach from Rage Against Machine. Huh. Zach De La Rocha were together in the guru van. And it was one of the longest drives of the tour. I think it was, I think it was the show to um, Chicago. So it was like a really long drive from the, from the Midwest to Chicago, something like six hours or seven hours or something like that. And the whole time we were in this van with this guru and we were just kind of like talking with him and it was, and it wasn't weird at all. It was actually super interesting. And Zach was asking like a lot of questions about like, he was, 
he was semi at least kind of curious about it. I mean, I know um, Inside Out, you know, they had that song like No Spiritual Surrender and stuff like that. So I think he was kind of, um, you know, and plus they had they had um, Vic in the band who was, uh, you know, who went on to become like a full Hare Krishna guy who was in 108. So he was somewhat curious about it. And I remember him asking a lot of questions like, what is karma? How does karma work? How can you get around karma? Like, how can you, you know, if you had all this bad karma coming to you, how can you kind of like avoid it? Um, and how is karma fair? Like some people are born rich. Like he was actually pretty inquisitive. And I remember we had sort of a nice time. <laughs> and it was sort of an interesting time to be plucked. You know, usually in the van we're talking about this girl's hot. <laughs> no, Jennifer Aniston is hotter than that girl. You know, and Kate Moss is the hottest. You know, we're just a bunch of like kids. And, um, you know, to go from that to talking about like, you know, what's karma about, you know, it was just, it was sort of refreshing. Yeah. I could see how that could, that would make sense. Uh, in my band, uh, we got into a, a habit of listening to DD King's rap album and singing <laughs> along just completely mindless, just hours of let's just play half American, half German again. So I could see how yeah. maybe asking, a asking a guru some questions might be a little bit more productive use of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was interesting. It was it was, it was cool. Um, you know, it's funny. I remember that whole D.D. King era of his life. D.D. used to hang out in Washington Square Park mm -hmm. every every day. D.D. Ramon would be there, and it was at that time where he got like all those really bad tattoos. And he used to sit in Washington Square Park with his shirt off, and he was like, you know, he's a drug addict. He's like super skinny. His teeth are all rotted out of his head. And I remember, I you know. I was in Washington Square Park like every day too, just like whatever, riding my bike or something. And I, and I was straight edge at the time. And I remember looking at Dee Dee and being like, you know, I should go over there and talk to him. And I'd be like, you know what? He's just a fucking drug addict. Like, look at that guy. He's probably can't even put two sentences together, which he probably couldn't at the time. The guy was in real bad shape. But it's one of those things, like you ever have those like real regrets in life, like that you didn't do something, but you should have done it. What the fuck, man? He's DDF and Ramon. I should have been talking to that guy every day. Holy crap, dude, tell me about the Ramones. How did the Ramones start? What was your first song? You know, what was the first show you guys played? I was like the biggest Ramones fan in the world, but he was so kind of drugged out and that I was kind of like, I, I kind of kept my distance from him. But now that I think about it, man, I should have been hanging tough with freaking Dee Dee King. <laughs> I probably could have, I, I probably could have dragged a lot of like really incredible stories out of him. You could have gotten some tracks, get, get yourself a verse, a little rap verse on his next, <laughs> on his next album. Know. Or whatever. Maybe I could have helped him. I was like Captain Straight Edge at the time. You know, I, I, I really regret not talking to Dee Dee Ramon, not I, taking him. Dee Dee, do you need a place to sleep, dude? Do you need some help getting off of drugs? Come to my, me and Richie's apartment. We'll feed you vegetarian food. I should have had like, a little bit more compassion or at least talked to him or at least kind of picked his brain. But man, I walked past that guy a hundred times, just kind of like judging him for being a junkie. And I don't know, I shouldn't have it, done that. It's did, rough, did man. You, did you ever see anybody sitting and talking with him that was like, hey, will that punk talk to them? Or was everybody just ignoring him because of the state that you know, he was in? It, not a lot of people even recognized him mm. because he had he had short hair. He didn't have that Ramones cut. He didn't have the leather jacket. And he looked really old and like mm. weathered. And he just and he, ha and he ha was like covered in tattoos. So not a lot of people even knew who he was. Like you had to kind of be like – on the inside to be like, Hey, that's Dee Dee Ramon. Right. And I, I never, ever, ever saw like a crowd of people around him, like sign this, you know, let me get a picture with you. Not, not once. He was just sort of like a seedy guy hanging on the wrong side of, you know, the drug, the drug side of Washington square park where you could, you know, buy any drug that you wanted to, he would be there, you know, sitting down or leaning against a tree. And he was just, he was in bad shape. It's rough, man. I, I've uh, I've had somewhat similar experiences, not with any members of the Ramones, but it's it's <laughs> weird when someone is in such a, such a rough spot. And I've also had the experience where I do try to do something to help them, and it makes my life so much worse. And I'm like, holy fuck, why did I get myself involved in this? And I think at this point, now, unfortunately, I have like some sort of jadedness to me where I'm not so sure I can help anyone, which is 
a shitty feeling to have when you walk by someone, you're like, I'm not even so sure I could help. Like, I don't even know what I could do. So like I could yeah. spend my time on it, but I don't think it'll be effective. Um, yeah, it sucks. Especially when you like really looked up to the guy and he played an important role in the music scene that you're a part of. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, I've actually, I kid you not. I've had dreams where I see DD Ramon in Washington square park and I go up and I talk to him and I like help him. Mm-hmm. I've literally had dreams. It's, 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 it's kind of like, it's weighed on me for so long, for so right. many years. <laughs> you know, just even like, even above and beyond the, um, the, Hey, it's DD Ramon. Let me talk to him. Like, you know, get some great Ramon stories out of him. But like, even just to like have so little compassion for a person that's in a bad way that you're just like, ah, oh, man, fuck this guy. I'm just not going to have anything to do with him when it's obviously the guy could have at least used some a help, few yeah. kind words to yeah. him. You know what I mean? I, I've been thinking about this because I grew up in uh, the Bay Area, so San Francisco, and I'll, I'll work in San Francisco from time to time. I'll have a job there. And I think that there's some sort of almost like secondhand trauma that comes from you see all these workers going to work and they have to step over people who are like half dead laying on the street and everyone just steps over them. And it's like, what are we doing as a society where we're just stepping over these people? And you, I mean, the rest of your day, you're like, what did I do? What am I a part of? I mean, especially in New York city where you have these super wealthy people like businessmen in suits and they're, it's such a hard hearted thing. You're just like, you have enough money that you could actually change this person's life with your freaking coffee money. Mm-hmm. And you're just like stepping over them. You know, it, just, it, 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 um, it ingrains like a deep sense of callousness in your heart. It's really, it's really, really bad. Yeah. 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 It's terrible. Uh, that's what the song, that's what the song make a change is about. Mm. It's about trying to, you know, I see on, see them on the streets to walk right by with little value on, on human lives. You know, it's, it's about, it's literally about that topic. Just, you know, disregarding people. Yeah. I think it has some sort of secondhand effect on ever it's, if you want to be a normal functioning member of society, you have to disregard people. And then you, you sort of get home and you're like, what the fuck did I do today? What am, what am I part of? Um, do, do you though? Do you though? Or is that something like I tell you, I, I live upstate in a really small town. Uh-huh. There, um, and I, I used to have this yoga studio in this town that's called Chatham, really kind of quaint little, you know, um, town with a, like, you know, one main street that's, you know, you could throw a rock from one end to the other. Um, it even has like a little vaudeville theater that they made into a movie theater. It's really kind of cool little town and there's no homeless people there. Mm. You know, it's like a little country town, but one time, one time we got our first homeless person Mm -hmm. and this guy would like, he literally, he had like a bike. He had one of those bikes that you would put like, you had like a little trailer that you would put kids in. You ever see that? Mm -hmm. He used to have Mm -hmm. when my kids were little. But he had like all of it. He didn't have kids in there. He had like all of his stuff and he just had that bike and he would like sleep on a bench. And let me tell you, like when people finally realized that this guy was homeless, the whole town was like, oh, my God, we have to help this poor guy. And like the whole town like rallied around and they came and they talked to him and they like, got him the help he needed. And they found out that he had a sister somewhere. And they contacted his sister and his sister came and picked him up. That's great. And it was kind of, it was kind of like refreshing. Like, why doesn't everybody do this? I think it's like, a numbers game too, though. Right. Where it's like small town and they like, Oh, we have this problem. It's like, there's this guy that we can help. And in San Francisco, it's like every day more homeless people show up and it's just a numbers game yeah. where it's, I also think that small towns have a little bit more of like a community, you know, your neighbor, San Francisco is like, you might not even know the person who lives next to you in your building and fuck that guy anyways. And I'm just here for my tech job. And okay. yeah. Yeah, that's San Francisco for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not that cool hippie town anymore. No, dude, it's a it, bunch of friggin' yuppies. <laughs> it's like it's like people. It's just like tech CEOs from a different place, like just like a different part of the country or even a different part of the world. And then there's a bunch of homeless people, and then there are these security robots now that patrol like parking lots for to like make sure that the the filth doesn't get in. <laughs> yeah, you, you know what sucks too is because San Francisco was one of those real kind of um, artist towns. Like there was mm-hmm. tons of like musicians and artists and you know creative type people. And you know once you get that whole kind of like tech thing coming in, they, all like the all the people that make that town cool and arty, they all get priced out. 
Mm-hmm. And then it just becomes like, you know, the Lower East Side now where it's just like all whitewashed and nobody, you know, no artist or poet or sculptor or musician and, you know, worth their soul can afford to live there. Yeah. So it's just, it, it's just kind of sad because San Francisco was, so, was, was really like that. It was such a creative, artistic place. And it's just not like that anymore. I actually notice a lot of bands will come back and I'll be helping them with their tours and we'll say, we want to play San Francisco. And I say, I don't think you do. Like <laughs> Oakland's <laughs> available. It's like, yeah, f- first of all, you really can't. There's like no venues for your size band. They're all, yeah. you know, run by Golden Boys or whoever. And they're all like 3000 cap. Um, but I don't think you do. Like there's no one there. You know, no one's yeah. interested in that. You have to go to um, Oakland. You go to Berkeley. You got to go to Gilman Street. Hell yeah. Porcel? Gil- Gilman Street is still killing it. I, I love playing there. I am so happy to be a part, a small part of helping bring some bands there. A lot of it is Nick, Nick Dill, the guy who runs our, our shows. And then there's just a whole community of kids at Gilman who run it all. The fact that that place is still alive is great. I think Green Day has a lot to do with it behind the scenes. I think when the bills pile up, I think Green Day low key. They don't, I don't think they, they advertise it very much, but I think that they float them some money. Uh, yeah. Green Day bought the sound system. Yeah. I think they buy more than that too. It's just like, oh shit, our fucking, we didn't pay our electricity bill. And I think that Green Day just pays it. <laughs> um, you want to know, you want to know what's cool? Um, mm-hmm. I do this online yoga class every day at 10 uh-huh. o'clock. Yeah. If anybody, if anybody out there wants to take my online yoga class, DM me on Instagram. My Instagram uh, is the hardcore yogi. And you can DM me. I have a lot of, a ton of hardcore kids in there that do yoga with me every day. But, um, uh, person that took my yoga class is the girl that does the sound there. With all the tattoos. Liz. What's her name? Is that her name? Liz? Yeah, Liz. That's, that's a friend of ours. She works. She does all the hard time shows. (laughs) Yeah, she's great. I, I immediately recognized her from Gilman Street. I was like, oh, my God, you're the sound girl from Gilman Street. She's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, that's so cool. So sometimes she takes my yoga class. And that's awesome. On that. <laughs> I got, yeah, I got to um, hang out with Liz. Um, I like Liz a lot. Uh, uh, Porcel, so that's actually what I was about to lead into. Uh, tell me what you have going on. Uh, tell me how you're holding up. I don't, you know, it's a kind of a rough time, but um, people who are a fan of all your stuff and, and you and – uh, I know you have a, a yoga practice and stuff. Um, tell the people where to go, what to check out, and uh, what you're looking forward to. Well, you know, 2020. If you know, if you're in any kind of like fitness, you know, occupation, 2020 really hit hard. Like I got, I went to India, mm-hmm. and then I got back, and we had a we had a ton of tours booked. Judge Youth Today and Shelter, and we were going to play the whole festival circuit, you know, for the summer. And we had a lot of these really big shows. We were actually going to make a lot of money. It was like, you know, crazy, you know, so these festival shows, they just throw money at you. They have all the sponsorship money. And um, I had all these really cool yoga gigs and workshops and retreats and everything booked for the year. And one by one by one by one, everything got canceled. And I remember being in March, like, what the hell am I going to do? Like my whole, all my money for the whole entire year just kind of evaporated. Um, so I started teaching yoga online and it's been really successful. It's been really kind of fun. It's almost like having your own yoga studio, but you just do it online. Hmm. And so if anybody wants to practice with me, um, it's, it's always growing bigger too. And I do it every single day at 10 o'clock, New York time, 10 AM. And, um, it's only five bucks a class. I have people that, you know, that do it every day. There's a lot of hardcore type people that, that are on it. Um, it's a good, strong class. You'll sweat. You'll get a lot of exercise. Um, we do chanting. We talk a little bit about yoga philosophy too. If you're into that kind of uh, thing, it's hour long from 10 to 11. So if you're, if you want more details on that, again, my Instagram is the hardcore yogi. Just, um, just DM me and I'll give you all the deets. That sounds terrific, Um, man. I mean, look, uh, if you're feeling down coronavirus, you're locked up. Um, this sounds like a great way to connect with some people, do some exercise. That's cool. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I'm also, um, you know, I'm trying to work on some new music, hopefully work on some new, um, new judge songs. I really want to write one last shelter record. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to do that. And I actually, I actually started a, you know, when Corona, when Corona hit, I had like, you know, I just had a ton of time on my hands. So I started, I started a new band. Um, it's kind of, you know, we're about like halfway there. Um, uh, with the songwriting, we already recorded about half the songs too. What's it like? So that, uh, 
it's sort of like dag nasty ish i'd say cool. but it's got a it's got a girl singer it's okay, really cool. it's 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 super cool so that's that's coming out soon. A lot more details on that in the next few months. Once we awesome. actually, you know, get everything recorded. Tell stuff. me about the tell me about the new judge stuff because I'd heard some whispers about that. I, I you know, um, I was fucking thrilled to be a part of your guys's um, Gilman show, and uh, a bunch of my friends traveled to go see you guys for the first time at uh, Black and Blue. And I'd heard some whispers that there's some new stuff in the works. T- tell me about it. Well, you know, one thing, one thing that's great, you know, that, that gives me a lot of, um, you know, hope for like doing some really cool new judge material is, uh, you know, Mike's voice, it's almost like better than ever. Mm. Like, you know, we'll play these shows and, you know, he's just like, he opens his mouth and that it's just like a lion starts roaring, you know? And so I really want to kind of capture that on tape. I think we, I think we can come up with like, a you know, some stuff that's a little bit progressive, but still has that kind of like judge growl to it. And I'm kind of interested, maybe not do a whole record, but at least, you know, maybe do three or four songs. Um, so we haven't really been um, too successful in getting everybody together to, you know, write that stuff. Cause everybody's actually like really, really busy and has families and you know stuff like that and kids. Um, so it's been a struggle just kind of like getting everybody on the same page, but hopefully, you know, you know, by next year, we'll be able to at least crank out just like a few songs. I think it'll be really good. I'm excited um, to hear them. And I want to do it. And yeah, you know, there's been some talk about doing uh, another Shelter record, which I would be really excited about because Shelter was one of those bands that wasn't really in like a box. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of it's it's um it's a little bit harder to write like a Judge record because there's so much expectations of like, okay, this is the Judge sound. And if you veer a little bit too far from that, like our kid's going to like it or a kid's going to think that this just doesn't sound like judge anymore. But shelter was such a weird band that it's almost like anything goes, you know, like we were almost kind of like, was yeah. almost, we were almost kind of like this Fugazi ish type band that we had some weird songs. We had some poppy songs. And so there's a lot more of colors to use in your, you know, color palette in your, you know, for, to paint the picture. I agree. People definitely have a more um, concrete expectation around what judge would sound like. I think that, I right. think that's correct. Um, but, you know, I think a band like, you know, quicksand or shelter, or, you know, some of those like nineties bands that, that went a little bit off the beaten path. There's a lot more wiggle room to come up with something really creative and, and progressive. And that's like what really excites me. Like, you know, even with Judge, I don't want to just rewrite bringing it down. Like, I just don't have an interest in that. Like, we already did that, you know, whatever, decades ago. So, you know, that's the tightrope that you have to walk, where you have to make it sound like Judge, but still make it sound somewhat interesting for, you know, what we're doing today. Uh, so, yeah, you know, hopefully we can we can come up with something that's that's really cool. Cool. Well, hey, look, when uh, the world gets back to normal, if any of your projects... Uh, coming to the Bay Area, please, please, please let me help out and promote him with the hard times. Uh, it always means a lot to me because grew up listening to your bands. And uh, yeah, anyone listening to this, go check out uh, the Hardcore Yogi on Instagram and get involved in those yoga classes. All right, uh, guys. Anyt- anytime you guys want to do some yoga, hit me up. <laughs> I need to get back in shape, man. It's been real bad. I, I might be there. <laughs> Dude, I-, I will. I will whip you into shape in freaking two weeks. If anybody thinks that yoga is sort of like for soccer moms, take my class, man. It's super challenging. I might be there. It might, it might be the boost that I finally need. All right. Uh, um, are you, are you friends with Trevor from vice and noisy? Yeah, dude. Trevor? I, know, I know Trevor. He's great. Trevor takes my class like every day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Trevor is a early hard time supporter. Uh, Love that guy. He's a, I had, we went and released our book. We had a New York event and I, I went and I had dinner with him. Uh, he's got some great stories. He's kind of like the old school guy at Vice. He's he's still got all that like punk edge to him. You know, Vice has changed a lot, um, and he and he's kind of like he represents a little bit of that. Uh, what Vice used to be a little bit, a little bit more on the edge there, a little bit less like, you know, here's a montage of uh, people singing a Hillary Clinton theme song or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I met Trevor when I was uh, when I was in Judge and we played Tampa. And we stayed at his house and he was probably like, I don't know, 15 or something. Like it was 15 year old. Yeah, sure. You can stay at my house. <laughs> we came, we like met his parents and like hung out at his like nice house in Tampa. And yeah, so I met him when he was like a little pipsqueak. And we've been friends ever since. 
<laughs> he's got some great stories. He told me some story about there was some fight that was going on and <laughs> someone had asked him to, someone like dragged him into like some ambush type plot or something. And he was telling me, he's just like, I had to get out of there, man. He's like, it was getting too intense. Uh, he's a funny guy, man. Cause I go to like, I went to meet him at the vice office, you know? And there's just all these kids that kind of look a little bit more like me, you know, they're a little more like 20 year old bloggers, you know? Mm -hmm. And then Trevor's actually kind of like was a part of actually cool subculture stuff that vice pretends to like portray, you know? Yeah, Um, exactly. I remember when I first met you guys, I, um, or one of the times I met you, I said, Hey, yeah, I'm I'm writing for noisy. It's like that vice thing. You guys want to uh, let me interview or something like that. And you guys said, do you guys know, do you know, uh, Trevor? And I said, no, cause he was my boss's boss at the time, but I, mm-hmm. I ended up getting to know him. That documentary that noisy did with judge, uh, was terrific. Uh, what that was, the thing name was of it? fantastic. Wasn't it? I think it was, um, bringing it down or something or there, there will be quiet. There will be yeah, quiet. That's yeah. what it was. But if you just look up like judge noisy documentary, it's like a multi-part video series that is, fucking epic it's like it's like the most epic documentary you want to know what's so crazy about that i have no idea how much money they spent on that thing but they hired film crews and that director and they followed us around for months (laughs) they went to europe they they flew a whole film crew to europe and like came to our shows and did all this like behind the scenes stuff and filmed all the shows and they followed us around for literally, I don't think it was like six or eight months, like filming wow. that thing. And it is excellent. It's so artistically shot. And that stuff that they dragged out of Mike. Dude, it's super it dramatic. Was, you have Mike. Stuff like, that I didn't even know. Stuff that have, I didn't know. I've been friends with the guy since the freaking eighties. I, he was saying stuff that I had never heard before. You have Mike like in like a, a wood shed with like a beam of light and like dust like uh, suspended in the air with him being like, that was a dark time in my life. I'm like, how did you get this guy to open up in such a dramatic fashion? You know, it looks like a fucking movie. Um, it does. It does. It's great. It's yeah. Really well done. All right, brother. We'll come back soon. And it was it was great hanging out with you. All right, guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Thank you. All right. All right Later. Take care. <laughs>